atmosphere of park. That is about in Hall B. Hall C is always interesting. We have a lot of uh, angio cases uh, being sent across the country. Thank you all, one and, uh, one and all, for their overwhelming response. We got about 400 plus cases. And when you're reviewing, you're reviewing it, we thought uh, the human body is so great and a lot of great work is being done by all our colleagues across the country. And uh, some of the interesting cases uh, we have selected, divided that sessions into uh, four complication sessions, which would be as visually interesting, innovative uh, sessions where you have some of the newer procedures, techniques, which are being demonstrated uh, across the country, you'll have that. And then you have uh, structural heart disease, um, mixed part puri cases. Those are the things how the angio case will be in Hall C. A little more in detail about Hall A, the main arena, basically you have live transmissions coming up from various centers in Hyderabad as well as across the country. And uh, in three interesting international live uh, cases will be, uh, today afternoon we'll have Dr. Antonio Colombo from Italy, and then you have Eberhard Grube uh, from Germany doing live for us. And then tomorrow you have uh, Royal Free Hospital London showing us uh, live cases in the international arena. Uh, the other important crux of the NIC meeting is basically NIC data presentation, uh, which we'll have on day two, uh, pre-lunch, that is 12 to 12.30. So that, uh, then uh, we, this year onwards, we also thought we'll share what is our NIC data, what our Indian data shows about each and every disease subset like CTOs, left mains, et cetera, and acute MI and primary PCI. We would share some more apart from the regular uh, data of about uh, statistics from various countries, leading centers, and how to proceed further with the data registry. Those we will share uh, in the NIC data presentation. I think with this uh, brief intro about this uh, conference, I welcome one and all, and uh, I wish we have left some space for discussion. I request all of you to participate actively and uh, enjoy, uh, clear your thoughts from the other leaders who are joining on the stage. And uh, with this, now I request, uh, we go on to left main conclave session. We request uh, Dr. Sridhar Kasturi, our organizing secretary, who put our untiring efforts uh, to make this happen. Dr. Sharad Chandra, our president, uh, CSI. Uh, Dr. Abhin Chakravarti, did he, is he come here? Dr. Sridhar? Dr. Sharad Chandra? We have uh, our um, uh, secretary, is Dr. Samitra Kumar. Can you join here on the stage? Dr. Shiv Kumar, you can come on to the stage. Other moderators for the session are Dr. Kajal Ganguly. Dr. Sarkar Mandal, Devabhata Roy, Dr. Shankar Prasad Chaudhary, Dr. Ganesh Mathan, Dr. Alok Majunda, Dr. Uh, Ghosh Roy. Any of you are here, please join. I wish uh, this our own meeting, all of you feel free, part of it. And uh, this, uh, I'll uh, hand over the session to our chairpersons. Uh, we have uh, three interesting talk talks coming up from Dr. Gambi, Dr. Kirtane, and Dr. Hiramath. How each session is being planned is basically, again, you have some talks and also have some interesting cases which are show the practical uh, ways of uh, tackling this problem. Each session go like that. And the uh, other chairpersons, moderators are joining. Over to you, Dr. Sridhar. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, after this very exciting first live demonstration from SGPGI Lucknow and uh, Apollo Hyderabad. We are on to the late main conclave session. With me here in the chair is the organizing secretary, Dr. Siddhar Kasturi, and we have other eminent moderators with us. So without wasting further time, I'll call upon the first speaker, Professor D.S. Gambhir, to present his deliberation. My journey of late main interventions from bailout to elective stenting. Go down. Go down. Let me see whether the sinners are running out. No, sinners are not coming. 
No, I think this is not working here. Hey, gentlemen, the signals are not working. They were working over there. Hello? That's what I told you that you should better check it up in the main hall. Uh, this was a angiogram. Uh, this was a angiogram, and this showed a very uh, tight osseal uh, left vein stenosis. Uh, I deliberated this for almost about two to three days with my cardiac surgeons, uh, with the patient's relatives, and with my own colleagues. And we came to the conclusion that uh, since surgery is not feasible and she is pregnant, so we should do an angioplasty on her, the left vein. And this was my first case of left vein coronary intervention. Uh, we did this using a, a bare metal stand crimped on a balloon under a cardiopulmonary support system and three days later the patient was discharged. We were very much encouraged by the success. Uh, there was a lot of criticism, some encouragement, some appreciation when I showed the first case in the 1996 NIC meet in Goa. Uh, but we did not get discouraged. We continued our uh, program on left main coronary intervention and uh, at that time, drug routing stents were not available, so we mainly embarked upon balloons, DCA, and the bare metal stents. So this was another case to show you the uh, left main body stenosis, which we did with the help of a DCA and then employed, deployed a bare metal stent. Now, uh, the in-hospital mortality was very acceptable in these patients who had a osteal and a shaft stenosis. The need for intervention was very low, and therefore, as said in the literature also, it is an effective alternative strategy and even better compared to surgery. But what about left main distal bifurcation? That's a real challenge for the interventional cardiologist. Now, even these are not running. Now, uh, these, as you know, left main interventions of bifurcation comprise almost about two-thirds of the cases. And it is uh, available from the literature that whenever possible, do a single strength strategy because of better outcome, both short and long term in these patients. But then there are certain cases carefully selected where two strength strategy is the only uh, treatment of choice in these patients. Now this is a classical example of a single strength strategy where there is no significant stenosis in the circumflex and you can put a strength. This is not running into a continuous loop. I think there are problems still with this in there. So there was no compromise in the flow, and we just put a long stent from left vein to LED, and that uh, served the purpose. I don't know where are they going. No, but the point which I'm going to make in the next 10, 12 minutes is, uh, when to do the left main bifurcation stenting using two stent strategy? Well, there are clear-cut guidelines on this. When there, is a, when there is a large size side branch, particularly in this case circumflex, and the area of distribution of circumflex is very large, well, two stent strategy is mandatory. And if, in your uh, opinion, the loss of uh, circumflex could lead to a real hemodynamic compromise, uh, the two stent strategy should be the treatment of choice in these patients. Also, to emphasize here that all left veins are not the same. Can you come here again, please? You are spoiling my talk because it's not running in continuous loop. Uh, because this is a continuous loop, and unless you see it time and again, you cannot appreciate it. Uh, all left veins are not the same. It's not running in continuous loop, because they, they run in continuous loop. After one loop, it stops. See? 
All this was set outside. Keep on doing like this, I can't. Anyhow, I think that's the problem of uh, audio-visual in India. Uh, the, this was uh, something to tell you that all the left main bifurcations and all left mains are not the same. Now, here is an example of a, of a, a patient who had a, a left main distal bifurcation with a bifurcation angle approximately 90 degree. I think I can stop it here because I can't uh, emphasize too much. The short left main with a large size LED and circumflex, and it goes on to the next one. Now here is the left main trifurcation. I think I'll stop here because uh, I don't think this is, this is going to work. Sorry, it should not. Because uh, I don't think that if I can show my videos properly, because there are a lot of videos which need to be emphasized, and there is some problem in their, in their system. I think you can call the next. Uh, next talk is on excellent noble trials, or the results really opposing by Dr. Ajay Kirtane. Uh, thanks so much for having me uh, here today. Okay, perfect. So these don't have videos, uh, fortunately, so I think I'll be able to get through it. Um, you know, I think we saw two wonderful left main uh, cases earlier today. And what always comes up, especially in the United States, is um, with these types of cases, which we know we can do safely, should we be doing them and what do the data really show? Um, and in that regard, in the past two years, Excel and Noble were two randomized trials that came out and I think largely validate the role of PCI as an alternative for surgery for patients with left main disease. But when one looks at the bottom line results of the trial, they may be somewhat uh, different in the sense that Excel was largely viewed as a positive trial for PCI and Noble was viewed as negative. So the question is, are these results opposing or do they fit together? And so in that regard, I do want to thank Greg Stone and uh, David Capadano um, for, uh, who did great summaries of these trials at TCT 2016 and for whom I've borrowed some of these slides. So. Uh, uh, Stefan Windecker and others presented a nice review article in Jack not too long ago weighing the pros and cons of surgery versus PCI. And I think we all know these. We know that surgery is durable, you get the benefit of left internal mammary artery, and then PCI affords the ability to potentially go home the next day in less invasive fashion and um, it, uh, basically have less procedural complications and surgery as a whole. And prior to Excel and Noble, what one noticed was that there was no real difference in terms of hard clinical endpoints, perhaps a decrease in stroke with PCI compared to surgery, but among other endpoints such as repeat revascularization, that was certainly favored via surgical approach. And the guidelines, which have not really changed since these trials have come out, which in my opinion is premature, basically gave cabbage a class 1B recommendation across the board, and PCI was a little bit more guarded and limited, particularly in the United States, where if the patient is eligible for surgery um, and with a high syntax score, it's viewed as sometimes class 3. So these two trials, and I'll just go over them each briefly and then come up with some summary points, uh, were, were relatively large-scale trials looking at PCI versus cabbage for left main disease. These are unprotected left main cases, and in Excel, at least, this randomized almost 2,000 patients to these two strategies. In general, the patients needed to have syntax scores that were not through the roof. They had to be generally controlled, and the syntax scores for both trials, which I'll show you later, were in the 20s as a whole. 
Notably, though, bifurcation disease was involved in almost 80% of cases in the Excel trial, very similar results shown for Noble. And so this is not a trial, or these are not trials that limit the analysis or limit the inclusion to patients that just only have shaft disease or osteal disease, which many of us agree in PCI is favored for those types of lesion subsets. As far as the PCIs go, important point for both trials is the use of intravascular imaging, and we mentioned these in the cases this morning. These were used in the majority of cases, 75% of cases in both trials as a whole, 77% in Excel. Additionally, it wasn't just PCI that was done in an optimized fashion. Cabbage was also optimized in both trials in the sense that the conduits that were used typically involved arterial conduits in almost every case, and in some cases, up to 20% of cases, bilateral mammaries in Excel it was 29%. Uh, so cabbage was also optimized within these trials. Here's the primary endpoint analysis of Excel, death stroke or MI at three years, no difference in outcomes, although the curves do seem to be not only coming together, but perhaps going to separate between three and five years, and that's something that we eagerly await. But of note, there were decreased paraprocedural complications seen with PCI compared to surgery, and this was largely driven by paraprocedural MI. But beyond the hard clinical endpoints, it's also important to mention other endpoints that are very relevant to patients when making these care decisions. Items such as transfusions, bleeding, atrial fibrillation, renal failure, sternal wound issues, all of these things do favor an upfront approach with PCI that is offset by potential long-term benefits with cabbage. And this is one of the things that we need to really address with patients um, before they go for either procedure. And that's why I think the longer-term data is going to be very, very relevant in this regard. Now, if one looks at longer-term outcomes as a whole, there were no real differences in the major components of these endpoints, but as has been seen in prior studies, there was increased repeat revascularization seen with PCI compared to cabbage. Is this because stents are restenosing? Perhaps. Is this because we don't know, uh, we actually don't treat grafts when they go down? Perhaps. This is a multifactorial issue, but certainly does favor cabbage over PCI. But as a whole, when you look at endpoints uh, for patients, this absolute risk difference is not that great. And for many patients, they would trade an absolute repeat revascularization for having to undergo upfront surgery with sternotomy in most cases. The other unique feature about the Excel trial was that it did measure paraprocedural MIs, and this counted against the cabbage results, uh, especially up front. This was adjudicated the same in both arms with 10 times CKMB, upper limit of normal, within 72 hours, and or five times with other clinical sequelae. And this is something that will become hotly debated. There are analyses that were presented at TCT earlier this year demonstrating that a reduction in paraprocedural MI is associated with improved outcomes over the long-term period particularly cardiovascular death, but this is something that um, many people will argue about when, with regards to this trial. One thing that will, people will not argue about is that if you have left main disease, we improve anginal symptoms irrespective of how we revascularize patients. And particularly in the post-orbita era, we're going to hear the next talk is going to be on that, um, this is important because Relief of symptoms is a primary reason why we do these types of procedures. For left main disease, it's also prognostically important. And in both arms, there were dramatic improvements in terms of anginal um, frequency in these uh, two trials. Now, moving on to in, in Excel, moving on to Noble, what was Noble? It was a similar trial, but smaller. So 1,200 total patients, including patients that had left main disease that could be anywhere in the left main, including the left main bifurcation. Um, these patients were randomized and received either cabbage versus PCI. A main difference, though, was the type of stent. In this trial, it was the biosensors biomatrix stent as opposed to the Zion stent that was used in Excel. The treatment strategy was very similar, and um, actually the representation of left main bifurcation disease was up to almost 90% in Noble, and therefore similar to Excel. And finally, the use of IVIS numbers were very similar to approximately three quarters of cases. Cabbage, also pretty standard techniques or good techniques now with arterial grafts used in 95% of cases. Um, there are not further details in terms of the types of grafts and bilateral mammaries that I could ascertain from the presentation, um, but we would imagine that this is contemporary surgical practice with arterial revascularization used in many cases. The primary endpoint of the trial, which because the trial was smaller, could not be just death MI or stroke and had to include repeat revascularization, was in favor of surgery, largely driven by repeat revascularization, and therefore PCI did not meet non-inferiority criteria compared to surgery. 
These are the results with death, MI, or stroke, demonstrating similar results to Excel, but you don't see a paraprocedural advantage for PCI compared to cabbage because paraprocedural MI was not ascertained in the same way in this trial as it was in Excel. And with results out to five years, you see continued separation of the curves over time. Notably, though, one of the reasons for this was that there was a greater incidence of stent thrombosis seen in this trial compared to Excel. There was a 3% rate of stent thrombosis seen, and there was no advantage in terms of stent thrombosis compared to symptomatic graft occlusion, which was something that was not observed in Excel. And these the next two slides essentially summarize the two trials side by side, where you see that Excel is a larger trial. It was they were both multicenter, and in general, major differences really included the stent type, the Zions versus Biomatrix Flex, with uh, stent thrombosis rates of 0.7 percent versus 3 percent, respectively. And then additionally. Other items that come of note where there was an increased rate of stroke in Noble for reasons that are not entirely clear. This has not been seen in prior studies and certainly goes against what was seen in prior studies. But also, if you look at the other criteria, they are remarkably similar. Syntax scores in the mid-20s, distal left main bifurcation um, in approximately 80 percent of cases, uh, IVUS use in, two, in three quarters of cases as a whole, and even the surgical uh, practice was relatively similar. So that having been said, how do we reconcile the results? One potentially showing equivalence of two therapies and the other one showing a benefit for, P for surgery over PCI, again, driven by repeat revascularization. Well, first, if we limit our results to three years, and I think that's important, the Noble investigators did present data out to five years, but in reality, they only had follow-up out to three years, and so therefore, the three-year results are very comparable between the two trials, as shown here in this particular slide. And similarly, if we look at the rates of death, particularly cardiovascular death in the two trials, they look very, very similar and are coming in at the gross absolute rate that's similar between two trials. So while there are increases in all-cause deaths seen in these two arms, which for reasons are unclear at this point, cardiovascular death, which is typically what we aim to prevent with these types of procedures, is relatively similar over time. The final issue really relates to repeat revascularization and how that impacts patients. Notably, if you look at just standard KM estimates, they do favor surgery for both trials with repeat revascularization seen at lower rates with cabbage compared to PCI. But patients don't weigh an MI the same as they do a repeat revascularization, nor do they weigh a stroke the same way. And using weighting points that have been developed and validated through the literature, you see relatively similar results over time. And so that's why I personally believe there's equipoise between these two strategies, particularly if you do a good informed consent and inform patients of upfront risks versus long-term benefits of one therapy versus the other. So in conclusion, I do think that these two trials are more similar than people would like to think. There are slight differences based upon uh, trial sample size, also the specific stents that were used. But remember that left main disease, irrespective of revascularization approach, is really the only lesion subset for which coronary revascularization is unequivocally accepted as improving survival over medical therapy. So however you revascularize these patients, we help these types of patients that fit under this CHIP initiative. Expect guideline changes soon. In my opinion, it's actually too late already based upon these studies. And I do think that left main stenting for, P, uh, for PCI will move up to at least a, um, a, a, a 2A level recommendation in the guidelines. And then finally, also an important point is that distal left main bifurcation disease used to be avoided, but is now treated more routinely. And the Excel sub-analyses, there were some presented at TCT, really showing the outcomes to be very similar to that of the shaft. If you can size it appropriately and deploy the stents appropriately, I think uh, increase the interest and utilization of this technique for patients with distal left main disease. Thanks so much. Yeah, we'll have questions at the end. Uh, I will now request the next speaker, Dr. Hiremath, techniques for LM bifurcation and trifurcation stenting.
Good afternoon. I hope the movies run. Uh, so when we talk of uh, left main uh, stenting, uh, long sheath is generally my strategy. It's a seven French long sheath all the way to the uh, subclavian origin. Uh, uh, the culottes is generally a favored technique whenever I want to do two stent strategy because we are more or less reassured of a complete metal coverage uh, uh, in the area where we are going to put a stent. Uh, DK crush, the currently favored uh, strategy, uh, again allows you a good metal coverage, but a little bit labor intense. You need to go back forth again and again, but ultimately uh, seems to be giving a very good result. Uh, you're almost assured that you would end up with a final case and never miss this final case in left main stenting. A report, of course, would be very important every time you end up with a case uh, uh, to get this kind of result. So this is a, a bifurcation typically done with uh, DK crush. Uh, we did everything in the beginning of the procedure, including a cutting balloon. Uh, and typically, whenever you come back uh, with restenosis, uh, you would expect a restenosis at the mouth of the circumflex. And that is what you're seeing, that you have a uh, lesion which is uh, right at the uh, mouth of the circumflex. So my personal feeling is whenever we are run into a repeat uh, procedure requirement, uh, this is the area where we get a restenosis. Uh, 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 DK crush, uh, uh, pretty friendly in all kind of angles, uh, uh, whether it's an acute angle or a, a deep angle. The mini crush, uh, another strategy, if you are in the early phase of your career, maybe you could resort to this. Uh, 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 pretty simple, uh, but there's always this fear that you might miss the final case, which I think in left main stenting is not a good idea. This was an acute case, uh, patient hemodynamically very unstable. Uh, so you need to get the stent in first, never miss to put a stent. Uh, so we put a stent into the side branch, put a stent in the main branch, and then do the final case. The advantage is uh, even if you miss a final case, you've got your two stents in position. So when patient is uh, almost crashing, this could be a strategy uh, which might work very well. Uh, on routine basis, uh, always uh, uh, go for the main vessel first. Like in this case, uh, moment uh, we get the wire in, patient crash. So it was very important to get uh, left main to LED flow intact. And then we had a T with protrusion to the side branch, uh, getting you the perfect result. So always concentrate on the main branch uh, flow uh, very aggressively. Uh, this is another case where we do rota to the LED. Uh, at the end of the rota, we have two stents uh, placed as a T with protrusion technique, uh, giving flows to OM uh, as well as Ramus uh, in this situation. Re-stenting, uh, you have to be very particular that you do not have any disease at the distality of the left main. Uh, it's uh, pretty easy, like you don't have to recross, don't have to worry about anything else just to like two stenting. Always when we are doing V stenting, we need to reposition the back end of the stent uh, very correctly. And you could inflate both the stents simultaneously. So this is done with simultaneous uh, inflation. When you run into acute situation like this was, uh, a fellow was engaging when I was doing a live course uh, and he dissected the uh, left main and uh, the best quick way is to get two wires in, do an SKS, and SKS is the way uh, you can really salvage situation uh, in an emergency. Uh, this was another case who had a Lima functioning to LAT, uh, and this was the circulation which needed to be protected. So we, uh, we had a rotablator both uh, to circumflex as well as LAT, uh, did an SKS, and this was the final result. Uh, but the patient comes back with a restenosis, and that's really a bad news. Uh, when you have a SKS coming back as a restenosis, uh, uh, you would really uh, struggle. You can never get your two balloons in two separate lumens. So you have to crush one side, uh, work on single line, uh, uh, go for a recross, and probably end up with three, four, five layers of metal uh, to get a, a good flow uh, into this kind of situation. This case was no for repeat surgery because the lima was completely adherent to the chest cage. Uh, 
uh, when we do uh, V-stenting and the patient comes with an ISR, you still have a left main open. In this particular case, uh, uh, you can actually see uh, we have a V-stenting coming back with a restenosis, uh, and we had no difficulty in putting one stent left main to LED, the second one from the ostium down into circumflex. Uh, so it was kind of easy uh, despite the restenosis. Many argue whether we should open the strut towards the side branch, like this is a stent left main LED, uh, no problem with the mouth of the circumflex. Uh, but I'm the one uh, with this kind of uh, three important circulation branches on the uh, circumflex. Uh, I would just put my balloon just at the mouth of this strut and open. I think uh, the IVAS uh, and OCT correlation has shown that if you leave a strut across the face, the new intima could grow and probably could be a reason for uh, re-narrowing at a later date. And this is what happens. The operator 14 months back has um, uh, decided not to address the side branch. Patient comes back uh, with a critical narrowing of the circumflex. And now you realize that you already have a stain so we uh, did what can be called as a double culotte. This is your culotte with the old stain, and then you do another culotte with the new stain, and thus establish a, 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 a good flow after final kiss. And this was also in a very dominant left circulation. Uh, so it kind of takes a, a lot of thinking what you want to do uh, in these kind of setting. Uh, so this was over a period of about 15 months, uh, the, uh, 15 years. Uh, the uh, left main uh, stent is functioning well at the ostium, but the circumflex ostial stent has now developed a re uh, So in this case, uh, you already have metal there. You need to decide what is going to be your strategy. We didn't want to fail on stent on the ramus branch, so we put a stent in ramus first, uh, then into the left main circumflex, end up with a final kiss, but predictably the patient has come back with uh, ISR. Uh, we have done this procedure and 11 months later the patient comes back with an ISR of this nature. So we have to send her for a bypass surgery. There are already so many layers of metal lying there. So this is a case where during the first procedure the left main uh, LED stent uh, trying to get the ostium is projecting back into the circumflex. Again, a strong nidus for the intima to grow in and produce re-narrowing. Patient has severe angina when she presented and we stented left main to LED, did a final case to get this kind of result. This is a follow-up angiogram one year later saying that, uh, showing everything is uh, functioning very well. So when we do uh, a left main stenting, uh, so much uh, uh, invasion is required, you get an IVAS in, you get an OCT in, and the uh, possibility of longitudinal shortening uh, remains uh, very high in this kind of setting. Uh, here is a case uh, where you can see on stent boost, uh, the back end of the stent is completely hit uh, by a balloon uh, uh, trying to go in. Uh, we had to put in another short stent to get a full expansion, uh, and now we can see uh, the stent is fully expanded after we put in one more stent to get a perfect result. So uh, uh, when you end up, you must have a final result. You must also choose where your left main stent is going to go. Like in this case, our left main stent is going to go into Ramus because Ramus is actually a huge branch going all the way down beyond the PAX. Uh, there could be bad angles, like in this case, uh, we chose uh, Fielder FC wire to get in, uh, but apart from stent, we were unable to get anything in, like we couldn't get a cutting balloon, we couldn't get a post-dilatation balloon, and uh, uh, probably one would expect a restenosis. When you're dealing with an AMI acute situation, I think get one circulation open. So don't worry about the side branch, just a stain from left main to LED, patient stable, and then you can take a call on the uh, circumflex. Uh, you start uh, in an ACS situation like this, a uh, uh, young fellow, small inferior wall infarction, and we felt uh, we probably will have a very small procedure here. But uh, finally, we realized after opening that we had to do one bifurcation here. 
uh, one bifurcation uh, uh, at the OM and one bifurcation at the left main. So different strategy. This was a provisional one stain. Uh, this was a mini crush. And this was a T, uh, which finally gave uh, a nice result on this 39-year-old young gentleman. Also, when you deal with trifurcation strategy, you need to know which stent you're going to put first. So in this case, we put this drawn, one into diagonal, and the third one into LED to perfect our result. While in another case, um, when we have two side branches, as you can see here, one to LED and one to OM1, the first stent is going to the circumflex, second one joined to OM, third one joined to LED. So you need to have your strategy defined before uh, you start a procedure. And this is actually a surgeon's fancy, the way he has uh, and this looks exactly like a left main. But this is a vein graft, uh, which is looking like a left main on which the entire circulation is dependent. The imaging, uh, very important, like in this case, uh, there was no, uh, uh, the mouth of LED as well as the circumflex are pretty open. So we had no hesitation in putting a stent which was ending up at the bifurcation and not beyond, thus avoiding a two stent uh, strategy. Uh, in this uh, particular case, uh, if you see, uh, the angiogram looks a pretty innocuous left main, uh, but uh, this was the only picture which shows that there is a critical left main which was confirmed on IVUS. So IVUS again helps you decide uh, what uh, left main uh, is going to, uh, going to be carrying. And of course, every procedure must end up with IVUS or OCT to make a perfect decision on stent expansion. Uh, this is a lesion at the mouth of LED and diagonal. You do an FFR, FFR was uh, pretty normal, and we conserved this patient for over five years. Uh, patient continues to do well. So to summarize, uh, you must end up with a perfect acute result. Uh, you must have a bias. We will probably have a bias for two stents in left main bifurcation compared to any other bifurcation. Uh, can I go to my next slide? Or oh, the time is up, looks like. Okay. Thank you indeed for your attention, but it was uh, nice going through with you on strategies for left main. Thank you. So, 